in all of those moments when we too are waiting for a new Pentecost. The term the church has used for this is a new evangelization. And the formula is very simple. After, after the Holy Spirit has St. Luke list the names of the apostles, he says they were all together, gathered together, with one mind, giving themselves up to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And this little image for us, <clears throat> it's a reminder that part of our unity, part of, our, part of the strength, if we could use the term of the church, one of the ways in which we can be guaranteed of bearing fruit, as we'll pray about when we read the gospel of today's Mass, where our Lord says, remain in me, and you will bear fruit, is by remaining united to Mary, the mother of God, by remaining close to Mary, <clears throat> close to her in all of the ups and downs of our interior life, entrusting to her our apostolate. And as it turns out, yesterday and today, we celebrate feast days of saints that had a very, that each, each one in his own way had a particular role to play in helping the early church to understand who Mary, who Mary is. And also, I don't want to say they cultivated devotion to, the Mary, to Mary, but they, they continued the devotion that was always there. Recently, archaeologists have they've been studying, they've been debating and studying a particular, what they think now is the oldest image of Christian art. <clears throat> and it's from Syria. It's, it's in Syria. Well, it was, it was made in Syria. Though 40 or 50 years ago, the people at Yale somehow got a hold of it and brought it to New Haven. <laughs> <clears throat> so actually the piece of art now exists in New Haven. And the archaeologists say it's probably Mary at Cana. And they also say, it's pro again, it's probably from the 100s. And it's Mary at the Feast of Cana. But they say you can tell from the image of it, because Mary at Cana is there with our Lord, performing the first miracle. She's giving instructions to our Lord that they, th they say it's an image of the church. It's a reminder that the first Christians were, they did, they, they, they prayed to Mary as the mother of God, as the mother of the church, as the new Eve. <clears throat> and St. Irenaeus and St. Cyril, the saints who we commemorate, today is St. Irenaeus, yesterday was St. Cyril, they teach us about Mary. Yesterday also was not a liturgical feast day, but yesterday was the feast of the perpetual Yesterday was the feast of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. Another ancient feast day in the church. And another devotion. <clears throat> which is a reminder to us of Our Lady's constant help in the history of the Church. And if we could add yet another, another little data point as we start this time of prayer. Yesterday was also the 80th anniversary. It's a, it's a, it's a particular, yesterday was also a particular day <clears throat> related to Mary for Opus Day, because yesterday was the 80th anniversary of the day that our founder, St. Jose Maria, established the custom of 
praying three Hail Marys every night. To pray for holy purity, for ourselves, for everybody in the work, for our family, for our nation, for the world. So he did it in 1937, in the middle of the Spanish Civil War, as he was concerned about the effects of war, I mean, not just the effects of war, but war does have certain effects on the morality of souls. <clears throat> and his desire that we always go to Mary, that we go to Mary for ourselves and for others. When we specifically, well, every day we do this, right? We, we, it's, a, it's a custom that we pray these three Hail Marys every day. And it's not a custom that's unique to Opus Dei. It's a custom that goes back to the Middle Ages of praying three Hail Marys every day. It's yet another example of how our Father, in creating our norms and customs, He didn't create anything new. There's maybe a few things that are new, but He brought together elements of Christian spirituality throughout time so as to help us, laymen, laywomen in the world, in a way that's appropriate to our lives. <clears throat> and so we have multiple reasons these days to go to Mary. We have multiple reasons these days to remind us of the importance of being united to Mary, being united to Mary in prayer, being united to Mary with the others, and being united to Mary because Mary, we know that with you we bear fruit. We know that as Saint, and perhaps we could even look at the writings of Saint Cyril, of Saint Irenaeus, <clears throat> to help us to understand and to help us deal with Mary, understanding how we can go to her with filial confidence. We can go to her with our hearts, with all of our needs. We can ask her to keep us close to our son, to her son. We can ask her whatever might be worrying us, whatever might be our concerns. First of all, St. Irenaeus, <clears throat> they say that St. Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John. So he's very connected. He's almost immediate. Not, he's, he's two steps removed. <clears throat> he died, I think he died in 203. And Irenaeus, he ended up being bishop in Lyon, France. <clears throat> and he ended up being one of the first to really write a book cataloging and dealing with all the heresies, with all of the confusion that was going on in his lifetime. Where, and in, you could say in his lifetime, not only was there a lot of confusion in the church because there were, there were so many heresies, there were so many Gnostic groups out there sowing confusion. Interestingly enough, many of the Gnostic groups in that time, one of the things, one of the institutions that they attacked was the institution of marriage. And <clears throat> St. Irenaeus came to the conclusion, well, there's only one way we can really remain united. And Lord, I guess we could ask the question, did he, did he come to this conclusion because of this passage from the Acts of the Apostles? <clears throat> but he came to the conclusion, the only way we can really be united is if we're united with the apostles. And if we're united with Mary. And how can we be assured of this union with the apostles and with Mary? That we be united under Peter. The apostle who united the apostles. Why? Because Peter, it was in Rome, and Rome is the, 
is the mother of the churches. <clears throat> and then St. Irenaeus also says, well, another way we can be guaranteed, another sign that another sign of the unity of the church, another sign that we can be guaranteed of bearing fruit is being united to the new Eve, being united to Mary. St. Irenaeus reminds us that Jesus Christ, who is the Lord, who is the Logos, he created all things. He created us. He sustains us. <clears throat> just as he sustains right now all of creation. And St. Irenaeus says, what brought about the disobedience that took place at the tree in Eden? The, tree, the obedience of Christ on the tree of the cross reversed the disobedience of the tree in Eden. And the first person to hear this truth and to understand it and accept it was Mary, <clears throat> who, when the angel Gabriel announced to her this truth and that she, the role that she would play in, in bringing this truth about, she understood <clears throat> that she was playing the opposite role of Eve. Irenaeus, interestingly enough, he says, Irenaeus says, you know, let's not, let's not think poorly of Eve. <clears throat> Adam, Adam's job was to be the protector, Irenaeus says. And Adam, at the moment, when the devil is tempting Eve, she at least puts up a fight. <clears throat> she at least offers some resistance. And Precisely, there's three or four moments there in the, in the moment of the first sin where Adam, Irenaeus notes that whenever Eve responds to the serpent, she says we. And when the serpent talks to Eve, he says the plural you, meaning Adam is there, but he's silent. He's not saying anything. And he's supposed to be the protector. He's supposed to step in. <clears throat> And so Renee says, well, at least Eve put up a fight. <clears throat> she at least so showed a little bit of fortitude. Yes, in the end, she was deceived. And so Eve was seduced by the word of an angel. And so she flees from God after her disobedience. Mary, on the other hand, is when, she, when the angel speaks to her, <clears throat> she, she, she goes to God. She returns to God. She takes a step back in the direction of God. She bears God in her womb in obedience to the word of the angel. So if Eve ultimately was seduced into disobedience by an angel, Mary was persuaded by an angel to obedience. <clears throat> and so Mary is a constant advocate. She became the advocate. She became the conduit for the birth of the church, the new Eve, From the Virgin, as St. Paul reminds us, in the fullness of time, God sends his Son, born of a woman, born of Mary, <clears throat> so that he could vanquish sin, so that he could once and for all defeat the devil and his deceits. And it's through this woman, it's through Mary,
that the Son of Man will regain mastery of souls. It's through Mary that the church, and it's under the mantle of Mary, St. Irenaeus says, that the church will continue in its mission, in its mission of leading souls to Christ, her Son. Lord, we ask you that we grow in confidence, in confidence, and we thank you also We thank you for the so many means that you've given us to to grow in confidence in each person of the Blessed Trinity, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the saints, the martyrs, but especially Mary, your mother. St. Cyril played a special role also in confirming this passage from the Acts of the Apostles, that Mary is the mother of God. Again, we were, when Cyril was living in the 400s, the early 400s, that was actually a time when the government in Constantinople was trying to control the church. <clears throat> the government in Constantinople was saying, the church, I've heard these phrases, I think I've heard these phrases in the last year. The church needs to change her message to conform to what we, the government in Constantinople, want to do. It's about time that the church, you know, get with the times. She's going to have to change. At this particular moment, what the government in Constantinople wanted <clears throat> is they wanted the church to not be, so, not be so insistent on the fact that Jesus Christ was true God and true man. They wanted, and it was, if you study the history of it, at least the way Cardinal Newman tells the history of it, there, were certain <clears throat> there was a certain group of people that they had a lot of money, They were opposed to this teaching that Jesus Christ was true God and true man. And they started funding Catholic scholars to downplay the divinity of Christ. And so eventually the church said, the church had to organize a council. And it's really interesting, the details too, because these these early councils, like the Council of Nicaea or the Council of Ephesus, it was the church who basically had no power, no money, no resources, versus the emperor and the bishops and the priests and the theologians that the emperor could buy. <clears throat> or the bishops and priests and the theologians thought, well, we have to compromise the faith so that we can have power, so that we can share in the power of government. And of course, they threatened all sorts of barbarities against the church, sometimes committing barbarities. And they did the same with Cyril. Cyril realized at one point, well, if Jesus is God, if Jesus Christ is true God and true man, and Mary is the mother of Jesus, as the, as the Acts of the Apostle tell us, well, then Mary is the mother, it's logic. Mary is the mother of God. And St. Cyril says, if anyone could doubt the right of the Virgin Mary to be called the Mother of God, this fills me with horror. She must be the Mother of God. If she gave birth to Jesus Christ, then she's the Mother of God. This is what has been taught to us by all of the Holy Fathers, going back to the Apostles. This, St. Cyril tells us, is the distinctive mark of Holy Scripture. That it makes a twofold declaration about Jesus Christ. That he has always been God. 
and that he took his flesh from the Virgin Mary, who is the mother of God, and became man. And we may think, sometimes we may be tempted to think, well, these are just nice statements, but what do they mean? And St. Cyril composed a prayer to Mary to indicate to us what they mean. And perhaps we could repeat this prayer. He says, Hail Mary, Mother, eternal temple of the Godhead, venerable treasure of creation, support of the true faith, on which the church is founded throughout the world. Through you, Mary, the Most Holy Trinity is revealed. Through you, Mary, the Trinity is adored and glorified. Through you, Mary, demons are vanquished. Through you, Satan is cast into hell. Our fallen nature can once again live with the hope of heaven. Through you, Mary, we are released from the bonds of idolatry. We come to the knowledge of truth. Kings rule through you. You are the light. You have given birth to the light that is the star of the nations. People, cities, nations, through you pass from the shadows of death and darkness into the light. It's an elevated language that the Greeks would write in. And perhaps now in in the English language we say things in a less elevated way. But St. Cyril was expressing for us something that our Father also taught us. Taught us, again, in a different language, but the same thing. When we are in times of difficulties, our Father says, what do we do? We address Our Lady, Our Lady of Perpetual Help. We address her, our Father says, with confidence. Our Father says we can repeat these, we can repeat any aspiration we like. But many of the aspirations from the Litany of Loretto, which we pray every day when we pray the Rosary, these are aspirations we can repeat throughout the day. He says, in times of difficulty, we can repeat these aspirations from the Litany of Loretto. Auxilium Christianorum. Help of Christians. <clears throat> if you repeat it, our Father says, with faith, with the tenderness of a daughter, you will discover the power of the intercession of your Holy Mother Mary, who will lead you to victory. <clears throat> When you cry to her from the depths of your heart without knowing what to say, without knowing what to do, and you go with confidence to the Virgin Mary and you say to her, my mother, and then whatever title you want to put in at that point, help of Christians, our Lady of Perpetual Help, intercede for me. She will make you feel. She will make you, she will come to help you to see the closeness how close you are to God. This is why the church in the Mass in all of the Eucharistic prayers calls on the memory of the of Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, as a way of reminding us <clears throat> right before the consecration or close to the consecration 
of our unity with Mary, of the help that Mary will bring to us, of the help that she will bring to many souls because of our prayers to her. We know that she's like an anchor for us. She, as we see at the foot of the cross, as we see at the birth of the church on Pentecost, in the mystery of the divine economy, again, this is from our Father, in the mystery of the divine economy, and also in the history of Opus Dei, Our Lady is a full participant. She's a full participant in the work of our salvation. She's following the footsteps as just as she followed the footsteps of her son. She's following the footsteps of Opus Dei. <clears throat> and she's following the footsteps of each one of us. If she followed him from Bethlehem to Nazareth to Cana to the cross, she's following us <clears throat> in all of the equivalent events of our life. From our birth to the ordinary hidden life that we live every day, wedding feasts that we go to, <clears throat> webinars that we might give, or whatever else, however else we might be reaching people these days, and in the sufferings of our life. She's there. She's there. She's a full participant in the work of salvation that's going on in our souls, in our city, in society. <clears throat> Mary, may we always go to you for filial confidence. And we do go to you now for filial confidence. And we entrust to you. We entrust to you the resolutions from this workshop. We entrust with, to you the apostolic initiatives that come out of this workshop, <clears throat> knowing that with you, they will bear fruit. They will bear fruit in service of your Son. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations that you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me.